You may be seated. There's more. Okay. Are they coming? Good afternoon. I am Bill Slattery, son-in-law of Dr. J. Adams and the pastor of the Redeemer Presbyterian Church where he attended and where his wife, Betty Jane, is a member. Welcome this afternoon to the memorial service for Dr. J. Edward Adams, a time in which we want to remember and celebrate his life to the praise of God's glorious grace. There will be scripture reading, singing, some reflections shared by family, ministry colleagues, and friends, and a message from the scriptures. I want to thank the leadership of the Admiral Creek Baptist Church, pastored by my son-in-law, Donald Thomas, for allowing us to use their church facility this afternoon. And at this time, I'm pleased to introduce my son-in-law, Reverend Donald Thomas. He's going to read scripture. And following him, my daughter, Caitlin, will share some reflections from the grandkids, and her husband, Will, will lead us in prayer. If you knew Jay, you know that he believed in the sufficiency of Scripture. Be reminded from God's Word today of God's sovereign love and care for those who grieve. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him, for He knows who, how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. I just want to take a short moment to share briefly what Jay Gramps meant to me. The first time I heard of Jay Adams was in high school. It wasn't because of his preaching. It wasn't because of his books or his counseling. It was because I wanted to date his granddaughter. I remember Collier telling me in a matter of words that her grandfather had basically started the biblical counseling movement and that he had written many books. And as a high school senior, I thought, yeah, okay, it can't be that big a deal. I was wrong. I know he was suspicious of me when I first met him because I'm Baptist, of course, but he never gave me too hard of a time over baptism. He was always gracious and kind. However, he was concerned that I be reformed in my theology, and I wasn't when we first met, and we had many good and lively conversations, as you could probably imagine. I'll never forget the day I told him that I had been convinced of the doctrines of grace. He responded with the biggest smile in the world, that's great! And then he said, but what about the L? Speaking of the tulip, are you convinced of that too? I said, I am. He said, good, because that's the meat of it all. 
He said, people who don't believe in that one are people who like eating sandwiches without meat. That's classic Jay Adams. And then in my first seminary class, it was intro to biblical counseling. And at the top of the required reading list was Competent to Counsel by Jay Adams and other books of his. I remember telling my professor that Jay Adams was my grandfather-in-law. And he responded, no, he's not. I said, he is, and I live right beside him. No, you don't. I said, I do. At that point, I began to appreciate the ministry of Jay Adams. I thought, I live right beside this man. I should learn all I can from him. And so I went over and asked him, can we begin to study the Bible together? He said, sure, come over every Tuesday and bring your Bible. So I did. The first day I brought my ESB Bible, put it on the table, and he plopped his Greek New Testament, and I knew it was serious. <laughs> and for a matter of weeks, Jay Adams walked me word by word through 1 John. I'm privileged that we had that time. And then we moved away to pastor a church in Maine, and Granny and Gramps listened to my sermons every Sunday night from a distance, of course. And I struggled early in ministry, doubting if preaching were a gifting or not. And Gramps never let me doubt. His words of encouragement kept me on going many days. And I knew he wasn't just telling me what I wanted to hear. You all know he wasn't that kind of person. I've, been, I've considered him one of my biggest encouragers, and I will miss that. As I talked with him this past summer... He mentioned how hard it was to be confined to a chair all the time. I asked him, if you could do one thing unhindered for an hour, what would you do? He thought for a second, nodded his head. He said, I'd probably spend the first 30 minutes thinking about what I wanted to do. I said, would you go fishing? He said, no, I've already caught the biggest fish I ever want. I said, maybe you'd take Betty Jane dancing. And he looked down his nose and said, hardly. <laughs> I said, maybe you'd fill in for someone preaching. And he thought and then nodded. He said, that's what I'd do. I came to respect the man in ministry of Jay Adams over a short amount of time. I'm thankful that I had the chance to know him closely. I'm thankful that he served as a mentor to me. I'm thankful that God gave him to the church. Many of you call him friend. Some of you call him pastor, counselor, professor, and preacher. One called him husband. Four called him dad. The family called him gramps. And it's comforting to me to know that the Lord now calls him good and faithful servant. May we all be encouraged to press on toward Christ with conviction, perseverance, and grace, as Jay Adams did. When all of us grandkids began to share our memories of Gramps, we noticed a few recurring themes. First, Gramps was a gifted teacher. We learned so much from him. He taught us how to draw, how to whistle, how to drive the lawnmower, the Lawrence Welk cheek pop. Shh. Once he even taught us New Testament Greek, although that didn't quite stick. But we did learn how to speak Abinglobish. His knowledge seemed endless. Kara, in fact, recalls telling our mom one election season that Gramps should run for president because we thought that he literally knew everything. Then there's the memorable car trips, rides in the old blue truck that Cameron put a large dent in at the age of three, trips to the grocery die count, the S in discount on the sign had fallen off, uh, to pick out candy bars. He would make us count out change from his coin pouch to pay, our, to pay ourselves. 
trips to Do Drive In, where we enjoyed eating hush puppies and learning how they got their name. And we would have to wait an extra 30 minutes for the fried chicken that Gramps ordered every time. Our big road trip across the country before the days of GPS. Gramps had his giant road atlas with our route exactly highlighted. And of course, each car trip beginning with, we're off like a herd of wild turtles. Gramps had the coolest phrases. Snarky, hot ziggity. When you asked him how he was doing, making it. Get me that goodie over there when asking for the remote. And of, of course, after enjoying a delicious meal, that hit the SBOD. We all remember Gramps as our loose tooth puller and bedtime storyteller. And each of us have our own special memories of Gramps. Luke raising alternating eyebrows with Gramps from across the dinner table. Collier being embarrassed when Gramps would pick her up from middle school. And yell, peanut, out the window of his old gray Plymouth. Cameron being glad that Gramps could laugh at the sinking of old red. Gramps pickup truck that rolled into the pond by Cameron. Uh, Christopher coming over at nine at night again and again to fix some new problem on Gramps' phone or tablet. These are just a few of many more. You see, Gramps always had a way of making each of us feel special. He spent time with each of us individually and encouraged our hobbies. He never made you feel like he was too busy for you. He always made you feel valued and loved. We're so grateful to have you as our Gramps. I'm grateful and privileged to have been able to call him Gramps as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift, and we praise and thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you that Christ died for our sins in agreement with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in agreement with the Scriptures. And Father, we praise and thank you for the gift of Dr. Adams, Jay, Dad, Gramps. Thank you for opening his heart by your Holy Spirit to receive the good news of Jesus Christ as a young man as he read through the scriptures to put his trust in Christ to be saved from his sins and then spend his life not only holding on to the good news himself, but also announcing that good news, teaching your word to countless others from the pulpit in the counseling room, in a study, and writing with family, friends. And Father, we praise and thank you for the hope that is in Christ, not only for this life, but for the life to come, that Christ has been raised from the dead. Therefore, we know that Gramps is now in your loving arms, in the presence of his Savior, and looking forward to being raised in the body when Christ comes again. As the Apostle Paul says in a portion of Scripture that Gramps loved and shared so much with me. For as in the first Adam all die, all those who are in Christ, the last Adam, will be made alive. Death has been swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we praise and thank you that because of your grace at work within Gramps, he was always abounding in the work of the Lord. Jesus Christ, not only in his public ministry, but as we've just heard, uh, even more profoundly in the ordinary moments of everyday life, in family, friendships, relationships, sharing stories and car rides and meals, and all of us in so many different ways have enjoyed and benefited from the fruits of his labors. We thank you. So Father of compassion, God of all comfort, comfort us this day as we grieve and in the coming days as we grieve, with the knowledge of this hope that Gramps is now and always will be with his Lord. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.
This time, let's stand together and sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, I say, If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. I love As long as thou lendest me breath, and say when the death do lies cold on my brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. seated. This time you're going to hear from several ministry colleagues that my father-in-law had through the years, and they will introduce themselves, and they, these are all preachers, so I have explicitly told them they have two minutes. <laughs> uh, only one person has a little bit more, and that's Don, and he's going to lead the way. Don? Thank you, Bill. What a joy it is to talk about my friend Jay Adams. Uh, my name is Don Arms. Uh, for the last 20 plus years, it has been my joy to work with him in a ministry called the Institute for Neuthetic Studies, uh, a ministry by which we made Jay's training available to people uh, by extension. We started off sending big boxes of VHS tapes to people, and that has evolved until now we can do it online, and it has been a joy to work with Jay. Recently, it is more recently, it's been my joy to work with him in keeping and putting back into print a number of his books. And I remember well a conversation I had with Jay uh, about a year ago as we were working through his New Testament. 
you all know, Jay has produced his own translation of the Greek New Testament. And we were going through uh, talking about some edits, some changes. And he, he took me to Ephesians chapter 4. And he wanted to make some change there. And I want to read to you Ephesians 4. Uh, I would read it the way it's normally translated. Ephesians 4 verse 15 Speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all respects unto him who is, who is the head, that is Christ. And he showed me his Greek New Testament, as though I could <laughs> make good sense of it. But, but he pointed to the first word there and he said, you know the word speaking isn't even in the text. The first word there is the word truth. And to translate it literally, you would have to say, you'd have to translate this verse truthing in love but that's a horrible translation I got a whole discussion with him about the trials and, and difficulties of doing a good translation but he said you know the context isn't speaking at all that doesn't occur till later on the context is the truth J. Adams loved the truth and uh, he was committed to the truth and he was exercised when he heard people use this verse to say, we need to be speaking the truth lovingly, when that is not what the verse says at all. Uh, we're to truth in love. But Jay said, we're going to change that translation to maintaining the truth, because in the previous verse, he'd been talking about avoiding error and, and holding to the truth. And then, then in the rest of the verse, he talks about holding to the truth. And so he said, we're going to translate that by maintaining the truth in love. But for Jay, as you know, Jay never had a touchy-feely bone in his body. Uh, that is not what this verse is saying, that we are supposed to speak lovingly. Love is not the way we speak. It is the reason we speak the truth. The truth is not, it is the goal in all this. So you ought to all get your copy of Jay's New Testament. You all have one, I trust. Uh, the newest version translates this by maintaining the truth in love. First time I met Jay was when I was a pastor in southern Iowa, and I was over my head. It was just a little county seat church, southern Iowa, and uh, I quickly found out I was not equipped for this. One of my deacons had... Uh, just left his wife, got involved in an adulterous relationship with a woman he met at work. Everyone in the church was related to this man, and I was lost. The, uh, this man's mother had been to the big city bookstore, Christian bookstore, and picked up a book that explained to her that the reason her son had gotten involved in this relationship was her fault. Because as a mother, as a child growing up, he didn't let this man sow his wild oats. And now he was experiencing a common psychological disorder called a midlife crisis. And so the reason that he's going through this was her fault. And I felt like I'd been stabbed because I didn't have answers and I wasn't helping this family the way I should have been. They've gone and they have picked up this stuff. And I, about that time I learned Jay was speaking at Calvary Bible College just over the border. Uh, so I went down there and heard him speak, and I was amazed. And I, during one of the sessions when another speaker was speaking, he kindly uh, spent an hour with me. He didn't, he'd never met me before, and he listened to what I was going through, and uh, he just reached out and gave me a big hug. No, you know, you know he didn't do that. <laughs> But what he did was he told me the truth. He told me what I really already knew, but he, he just very clearly told me that uh, there was a reason God in his providence put me in that church at this time in its history. 
And God was going to give me the ability to deal with it. And then he reminded me what the difference was between a shepherd and a hireling. Because I was seriously considering going back to work for UPS. But Jay, in his, in his wisdom, uh, just pointedly told me the truth. And uh, all the men sitting here on this platform and everybody who's had interactions with Jay could tell you the same thing that I just did, is that Jay loved the truth. And he wanted, he believed that the most loving thing he could do for people was to tell them the truth. I don't have Jay to teach me those things anymore, but I have what he has written. And I am so glad that we have left for us a deposit of truth. And uh, several years ago, Jay and Betty and the family entrusted to us the legacy of Jay's books. And it is now my life's purpose for whatever life God gives me the rest of my life is to watch over that trust. And I commit to you, Betty and the family, that we at Mid-America Seminary and the Institute for Neuthetic Studies will be careful stewards of that trust. Not only for your sake, but for the sake of the Church of Jesus Christ at large. Can you imagine what God could do through the Church of Jesus Christ these days if we could get people reading J. Adams? My name is John Babbler. It's my privilege to bring you greetings and condolences from Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary. Some of you may not know that at the young age of 86 years old, Dr. Adams began a new biblical counseling program at Mid-America Seminary. It's my privilege to have taken over as chairman of that department this past summer. And I'm just honored for the opportunity uh, to continue along with Don and INS to uh, keep the heritage before people of uh, Dr. J. Adams. While Jay has passed on from this life to his heavenly home, he lives on. Of course, he lives with his Lord, but he also lives through his heritage and through our memories. His heritage is rich, his family, their impact for the Lord, his lasting impact in biblical counseling and in the churches that he has led, his writings, his friends and colleagues are just a few examples of that ongoing impact. He lives on through our memories as well. A pastoral note here, don't hesitate, don't forget to share those memories with each other. Others around us in this room and those maybe who don't even know Jay can be blessed as we share our memories of him. Our memories of him are numerous and they're precious. I thought of many of those memories this week. I remembered his pastoral heart. When I first started going to night conferences, I was a Southern Baptist seminary professor and at that time in the early 1990s, there weren't many Southern Baptist seminary professors in Nank. And yet Jay accepted me, encouraged me, mentored me. While I was teaching at Southwestern Seminary, I taught there for 28 years before coming to Mid-America. We took a number of classes to the Nank annual conferences. We loaded up in a bus in Fort Worth and drove to wherever that conference would be. And I remember his pastoral concern for those students as he would always make himself available to, to eat lunch with the students. And I remember the impact that his time and attention and his words had on those students. I, I remembered as I reflected this week about his teaching impact. Some of those students that went on those trips to the night conferences, they were skeptical about biblical counseling 
And on more than one occasion after the Monday night sessions where Jay gave the plenary address, one of those skeptical students would, as he was getting on the bus, tell me that it was Jay's address that caused them to accept and finally understand biblical counseling. Jay's address had won them over. As I shared these memories and some others with my wife, she suggested that as significant as they are, Jay would really want us to remember his Lord. I thought of visiting his home on September 11th this year when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the publication of Competent to Counsel and when Don presented Jay with the Festrift. Jay was very appreciative, but maybe a little uncomfortable with the tributes we shared with him. And at the end, he said, thank you for all your kind words, but remember, it is the Lord that did anything worthwhile, not me. My wife was right. While Dr. J. Adams does live on, I think he would want us to keep it all in perspective. It was the Lord that did anything worthwhile. I, however, am very thankful that Jay went along for the ride. Luke 17, 10. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Thank you, Lord, for your servant, for your slave, Jay Adams, and please give us the grace to follow his example in the days to come. I'm Bill Hill. I've had the privilege to consider Dr. J for the last three or so decades, a mentor and a ministry friend. Occasionally I would call his home early in my pastoral ministry. Miss Betty, sweet, gracious Miss Betty, would answer the phone and I would tell her who I was and she would say, well, we're glad you called, Bill, and let me go get Jay. And Dr. Jay would get on the phone, and I would say, hello, Dr. Jay, I'm Bill Hill from Brevard. And he would say, well, hello, Bill Hill from Brevard. Uh, inevitably, he would always greet me that way. Our pastors for New Thetic Ministry team that we had organized for probably 20-plus years had the opportunity many times of meeting with Dr. J at a little Italian restaurant in Ennery, South Carolina. And we would sit around that table and interact with questions. We had a little food and a whole lot of wisdom uh, from Dr. J as he would respond to our questions. And he loved to do that. Uh, he indicated that that was one of his favorite venues for teaching and interacting was just being able to field questions. And uh, we had many of them. He affectionately dubbed us the Baptist Bunch from uh, North Carolina and uh, he was gracious with all of us Baptists and was very kind and he would always get the plain cheese pizza. He said that always set better with his diet and so forth. So Miss Betty, you would be pleased that he stuck with his diet. His prolific pen was powerful. He had a unique ability to address the very issues faced by young and old pastors alike, not in theoretical, hypothetical, or merely academic ways, but in ways that brought the appropriate biblical text to the milieu of life, one of his favorite terms, by the way. One man uh, stated several years ago, it's easy to be hard to understand. It's hard to be easy to understand. Dr. J labored to make his teaching life related. Easy to understand and easy to use. He would put the cookies on the bottom shelf so they were easily accessible. Dr. J lamented complexity is often the cover for error. His teaching was the antithesis of that. One of the characteristics that I so appreciated 
about this man was he was available. He was approachable by the ordinary little pastor. He was easy to get to because he was willing to be gotten to. He never played big shot and made like life was too important to spend it with people. I've never known a man more formally educated and at the same time more practically astute. In theological conversation, it was evident. In fellowship and everyday conversation, it was never a barrier. It was never a hindrance. He was for the pastor in every way. Once in a conversation that he and I had commenting on writing books, he said to me, there are many books out there written for the masses. Lots of fluff being doled out. But my focus has been to write for the forgotten man, the pastor. He was a shepherd to shepherds. He was a shepherd to me. His influence will always be woven into the fabric of my life, my family, in my ministry, I am profoundly grateful and indebted to the life and ministry of Dr. J. Adams. I am Lou Priolo. Before I ever met Jay, when I was uh, in graduate school struggling to defend the sufficiency of Scripture, to my professors and classmates alike, I began reading everything I could on the subject that Jay had written. He almost single-handedly kept me from losing my mind. I like to say that Jay is also responsible for my wife marrying me. After meeting Kim in 1986, she wasn't interested in even having a conversation with me until she found out I was one of those new thetic counselors that she had just read about incompetent to counsel. Jay became one of my personal mentors early in my career. For close to 15 years, we would meet once a year for a fishing trip on Lake Hartwell while he would let me pick his brains for hours at a time. I would save up all my theological and counseling questions and just take them out of my pocket and I would just rapid fire and he would rapid fire back with theology and scripture, it was amazing. I would glean everything I could from his amazingly deep well of wisdom. One year I remember coming up early and spending the night with Jay and Betty Jane. After a chat, I realized for the first time how astronomically high his intellect really was. I never noticed it before because he would hide it well. I'd been with Jay while he was counseling, lecturing, confronting other Christian leaders, but it wasn't until, it wasn't until I saw him at the checkout line at Walmart buying fishing supplies and I saw him relate to the cashier that I realized why I never appreciated his brilliance. He always treated and respected me and everyone else he knew like an equal. Unlike so many academics, his education did not, to put this as I remember in Jay's own words, it would not protrude from his personality like a freshly eaten piece, uh, freshly eaten prey protrudes from a python. One fishing trip in particular, I was really discouraged about the pervasiveness of bad theology. I was really depressed, actually, that the church had been going through at the time, kind of like today. I'll never forget Jay's counsel. First, he said, Lou, because the Bible predicts that it will be this way, it should give you great comfort in the veracity of Scripture. If it were not this bad, 
you might have reason to doubt the authenticity of God's word. The next piece of advice he gave me was fatherly. He said, Lou, just stay close to the theology of the reformers and you will not be led astray. I believe Jay will go down in history as one of the most notable reformers of the 20th century. Jay was a faithful friend to me and I know I'll see my friend again and I look forward to spending an eternity of fishing trips with him on the new earth. Hello, my name is uh, Randy Patton, and uh, I had the privilege of serving as the first full-time executive director of the National Association of Neuthetic Counselors, and uh, Jay was one of my board members for uh, most of the 16 years that I served in, in that capacity. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to just focus on three uh, areas. One is I want to humbly acknowledge Jay's shaping influence on my own life and ministry. Uh, before coming here, I pulled my copy of Competent Council off the shelf again and looked in the front, and I had purchased it in 1972, two years after it came out, when I was a young seminary student. And uh, that book had a profound impact on my life, and I began uh, seeking to hear Jay every chance I got, went to many, many conferences to hear him. And as a result of his writings and hearing him speak, um, there welled up within me a desire to, in some way, try to be like him and to teach the Bible clearly, precisely, and practically, God helping me. I'm so thankful for his life and influence. Recently, I started uh, compiling a list of the 10 most influential books in my life. And uh, Jay's at number four, and um, nobody else has repeated. Um, so thankful for him. Another area where Jay influenced me, this time by observation, was that I saw that you can be a man of theological conviction, a man of strong theological convictions, but gracious when you're dealing with people with whom you differ in some of those areas. I saw this modeled many, many times, uh, particularly when Jay was in Lafayette, Indiana to speak at Faith Church for their numerous training conferences. And I observed his friendship with Bill Goode, Pastor Bill Goode and Dr. Bob Smith, both men who held to their uh, Baptistic theological positions with just as much fervor as Jay held to his Presbyterian distinctives, and yet to see the warm, loving friendship that they had um, was just tremendous. And I purposed that I wanted to be like that, and to believe what I believe firmly, but to be kind and gracious with people that differ. I saw this happen in a personal way during the early years of my tenure as the executive director and when we're just still trying to get Neuthetic Counseling more broadly known, uh, we did what we called one day symposiums where we'd go to a particular city and hold one day of training and Jay would do three uh, general sessions and Cindy and I and another speaker would come in and we'd do a couple workshops and then we'd travel and go to another city three or four hours away and do the same thing the next day or the day after. And one time while we're traveling, uh, Jay's in the back seat behind Cindy and me in the van, and somehow the conversation got on eschatology. And my wife, who'd only heard me talk about Jay and commitment to biblical counseling and everything, discovered to his chagrin that he did not hold to a pre-trib, pre-mill position in eschatology. So my wife is turning around and engaging in this argument or questioning with Jay. You don't believe in Jay dealing with her. And I'm sitting there thinking, honey, be careful who you pick your theological debates with. <laughs> and I thought recently, you know, if we could have videoed that, it would be a YouTube hit for sure these days, seeing how kindly and graciously he uh, dealt with Cindy. We had some, some good laughs about it later. 
During the 16 years I was the executive director, I don't remember Jay speaking to me one time in a harsh way, even though I'm sure I disappointed him on many occasions. Third, I just want to remember Jay and commend his memory for his sense of humor. Um, I can remember in some of the earlier meetings, he was always getting after us Baptists for being so stuffy. I mean, take off your ties, guys, and relax. Numerous times I've heard him say that I've written two books in the amount of time it takes you guys to shave. Uh, more than once I heard him give in detail the proper way to make sweet tea. And it wasn't just Jay at times being humorous, but he had a way of handling when he was sort of the brunt of humor. My favorite story is, again, Pastor Bill Good at Faith Church in Lafayette. I remember he would have Jay in regularly for conferences and things. And anytime Bill could gather a few of pastors and other conference people around, he'd like to announce to them, did y'all know, I told Jay, your publisher sent me too many copies of your book on baptism. And Jay would always say, well, how many did they send you? And he, Pastor Good would say, one. And um, we would all, of course, laugh, and Jay would laugh too. And just that wonderful warmth of the commitment to the scriptures, and yet such a gracious, kind man. I'm so thankful for his life. And Betty Jane, my wife and I express our sympathy for you and to you. We'll be praying for you and God's comfort in the days to come. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea pillows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well. My soul, though Satan should buffet, though trial should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded. My helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul it is well with my soul it is well, it is well with my soul. Oh Lord, hates the day when the 
your faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Good afternoon, my name is Fred Parker. I asked Bill for an hour and a half, but I didn't get it, so I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. Jay Adams, you all know, a man who wrote over 100 books. He devoted his life to the study of scripture, he even wrote his own translation of the New Testament. I asked him why he did that, and he told me that he did that to force himself to study every single verse to the same amount, to the same degree. I went looking for Jay Adams in 1997 because of this book, A Call to Discernment. He included a lot of study questions in the back and I wanted to check my answers with the master, the guy who would have all the answers. For me and I suspect for some of you, this book is one of the most influential books I ever read because after all, without discernment, what can you do with scripture? if you can't figure out what it means. <clears throat> we began to get together over lunch. You know, in Jay's opinion, people don't eat enough pizza. <laughs> we ate lots of pizza, and we had lots of phone conversations. And I was right. He had the answers, and I carried a notebook. Sometimes I would question or challenge his answers. On things he was completely certain of, he would cite scripture, and he would not budge. On other things, he would make me work for it. He would challenge me to study for myself and find my own answers. <laughs> that led to more lengthy phone conversations, and I took more notes. He was never short or curt with me, though sometimes he would say, I think that needs more work. Or even other times, and he would agree with me and say, oh, that's really good, I never thought of it like that. Imagine me teaching Jay Adams. As long as it was biblical, it was worth talking about. But then, there were those few times when I would be struggling with a particular passage of scripture. And he would look at me across the lunch table and he would say very simply, I don't know. And when this first happened, you can imagine what I'm thinking, wait a minute. You're Jay Adams. You've read, it, read everything. You've studied everything. How can you not know? You even wrote the book on difficult passages. How can you not know? But I came to understand that I was seeing into the heart and soul of Jay. His strength of character was built on integrity, honesty, and total humility, all captured in that simple statement, I don't know. He was never afraid to admit that there were things in the Bible that neither he nor any of us can fully understand in this life. Can you also imagine the credibility that that gave him in my mind? I could always know that he would never make things up to make himself look good. I might push back or come to different conclusions, but Jay would never, never knowingly lead me astray. Well, now he's getting his own answers from the master. Jay Adams, a man of integrity and character and humility, who is not embarrassed to admit, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm Bob Land. Um, I came to know Jay Adams about 25 years ago uh, when I and my family started attending his church in Simpsonville. Um, I became good friends with Jay through the years and after he retired, um, I found out that he really liked to trout fish. And so I planned a trip to Montana for three days of guided trout fishing. We went out there and we flew into Helen, I think, and drove into Dillon, Montana. And that night we went out to dinner at a little restaurant. And we walked in this restaurant and sat down. The waitress came over. She was just ch cheerful and chipper. And she says, what would you like? And Jay said, well, what I'd like, I don't think you're going to have. And she said, well, try me. He said, well, what I'd like is I'd like some cornbread broken up into pieces, put in a tall stem glass with ice cold buttermilk poured over it and a long handled spoon. <laughs> she kind of chuckled and she said, well, what's your second choice? <laughs> and so she took our orders and, and uh, we sat there and talked for a while. A little while back she came back and sure enough, there's that long stem glass with cornbread ice cold uh, buttermilk and a long handled spoon and the look on his face was what I remember the most about the whole trip you know fishing was great in Montana but that's what I will remember the most about that trip was just he was just beaming when he saw that <laughs> so it was it was a it was a special three days for us um, you know, I can, I can go on, on and on about how Jay's preaching and his teaching and his writing affected my life. But I'm not going to do that because I know what he'd say. He'd say, ah, it's not about me. It's about Christ. So I'm going to leave it there. And I'm just going to say that Jay was my friend. I loved him. I'm going to miss him. Thank you, Bob and Fred, for your words. The first time I formally met Dr. Adams was after I wrote him to ask permission to date his daughter, Heather. The day that I met him, it was at Word of Life Inn, and we were seated and just talking, and at some point in the conversation, he says, Bill, I have something for you, and he presented to me. Louis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology. And in it, he wrote to Bill, May our great God, of whom this book speaks, bless you greatly through it, J. Adams. He was determined, even then, to straighten out this Baptist boyfriend of his daughter's. And it worked. Very patient. For the next 37 years, God used my father-in-law to help me grow as a, as a son and servant of God. In college and seminary, we talked about passages of Scripture and theological issues raised in class. In 1990, we started the Harrison Bridge Road ARP Church. Then in 1995, I came to this area to start Redeemer ARP Church. And throughout those 30 years of ministry, my father-in-law was always available to help me understand a passage I was preaching on, and at times, how best to preach that passage. He was always there to help that in that way. 
He was there to give advice on counseling problems I was dealing with and church issues that needed addressing. What I experienced personally over all those years was a microcosm of what his mission was for pastors in general. He loved the church. He loved the pastor. He wrote to help the pastor in his ministry. Another lesson he taught me by his example was the genuine love he had for his wife, Betty Jane. After the Lord, there was no person on earth he loved more. It was and is an example and a motivation to me. So God, thank you for my father-in-law, Jay Adams, for your son and your servant. As many of you know, my father-in-law went home to be with the Lord last Saturday afternoon as a number of us were gathered around him singing various hymns. When the roll is called up yonder, time, when the sands of time are sinking, Jesus loves me, this I know. And it was about at the end of that song that he went home to be with the Lord. Monday afternoon, we committed his body to the grave and his spirit to the care of the everlasting Father in heaven. The loss, the sadness, the grieving are obviously still a reality and will be for some time. However, we've gathered today to remember. We've been doing a lot of remembering to the glory of God. And we've come to celebrate the life of Jay Adams. And we can do that sincerely and joyfully because of the life-giving ministry of Jesus Christ. This ministry of life is spoken of in John chapter 5, 24 through 29. And here is what Jesus says about that ministry of life that he had and has. Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, I tell you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he has granted to the Son to have life in himself. And he has granted him the right to pass judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this because a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but to those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. The ministry of life that Jesus has is twofold. First, as we learn in the passage, Jesus has the ministry of giving spiritual life to sinners like you and me. Every one of us is born into this world a sinner. We inherited the guilt of Adam's sin, and also we inherit a corrupt nature. And it's from that nature that every one of you have sinned through the course of your life. As sinners, we are also born spiritually lifeless toward God. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And what this means simply is that from day one, you had no inclination or responsiveness toward God, and no ability whatsoever to please Him with your life. And to make matters worse, there was absolutely nothing that you could do about it in and of yourself. And left unchanged, the sinner will die in his sins 
and face life without God for eternity in a place of torment. Well, Jesus entered the world to do something about that. He came into the world to give spiritual life to dead sinners like you and me. God the Father in eternity, according to our passage, granted to His Son life in Himself and authorized Him to grant life to sinners who were spiritually dead. This is why Jesus says in verse 25, Truly I tell you, an hour is coming and now is here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So from the first coming of Christ, when He lived and died and rose again, to today, until He comes a second time, Jesus has a ministry of giving spiritual life to dead sinners. So when a spiritually dead sinner hears Jesus' voice in the words of the gospel, accompanied by the life-giving Spirit of God, that person crosses from death to life and receives eternal life when they believe in Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian here today, the Spirit gave you life. And you heard the voice of Jesus and the words of the gospel, all of which led you to trust in Him for salvation. My father-in-law was 15 years old when all that happened. He was made alive. He believed in the gospel due to the faithful ministry of his friend Milton Fisher, who gave him a copy of the New Testament to read. He read it and he was converted. And he never stopped reading after that. He would say, Bill, God gave me a voracious appetite for the Word of God. And it clearly showed. In large part, this is why we can celebrate a life well lived by J. Adams, for God and for the spreading of His kingly rule. Because of the spiritual life given to him by Jesus, he could And by the grace of God, he chose to live in the way that he did. Jesus' ministry doesn't stop here. We learn in John that Jesus will raise to life physically those to whom he has given spiritual life. Listen to what John says again. Do not be amazed at this, to what I've just talked about, because a time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come out, those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, to those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. So those who've heard Jesus' voice in the gospel and were made alive and believed in him for salvation, they will hear the voice of Jesus again when he returns a second time. The voice of Christ will call forth the dead And believers, like many of you here today, and my father-in-law, will be raised from their graves, be united with their perfected spirits, and will live eternally with God in a new heavens and a new earth. Others will be raised as well on that day. Notice how Jesus puts it those who have done good things to resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. That latter group is the unbeliever. You see, due to the unbeliever's lack of saving faith, the faith that saves, there will be no evidence of the fruit of faith. And so Christ, the divine Son of God and Son of Man, the eternal world ruler prophesied in Daniel 7, who was raised from the dead and authorized to judge the world, will look at the wicked works of the unbeliever and will condemn him to eternal life in hell. On the other hand, with the believer, there will be the evidence of good fruit growing out of the soil of true saving faith, the faith that saves. Not perfection, 
but attitudes and actions that are good in Christ that grow out of that gift of saving faith that God granted or God grants to sinners like you and me. And as a result, believers, saints of old, many of you, and my father-in-law will be ushered in the consummated kingdom of God to live forever with him to enjoy resurrection living in the new creation. What a day that will be. This is also why we can sincerely and joyfully celebrate the life of Jay Adams in this service. We're going to see him again in the new creation. And together we will celebrate not him, but Christ and his marvelous grace shown to us in giving us real life now and in the future. Will you be there to celebrate Christ in the new creation? Or will you come under his judgment and spend eternity apart from him? You know, if you believe, if you believe right here and now that you are a sinner deserving God's judgment, and yet you believe that Jesus lived and died and rose again for your salvation, if you believe that, that's clear to you right here and now, I urge you to repent of your sins against God and turn in faith to Jesus Christ, and He will save you. He will forgive you of all your sins. He will grant you the gift of eternal life. Then you too can celebrate Christ, the giver of true life in the new creation. Amen. This time we're going to sing the song in Christ alone. And I ask you to stand as we do. my 
Lucianne. Betty Jane, Lucianne. <laughs> Holly. Clay. Heather. Your families and friends uh, who are gathered here this afternoon to pay tribute uh, to your father, to a husband, and to give glory to our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, uh, this dear man um, who is now in the presence of our Savior, brothers and sisters in Christ. Jay Adams was so many things. You've, you've heard so many this afternoon um, make statements about him. And um, so much more could be said than has been said. We could be here all night and not say even the half of it. As a public man, Jay Adams was a theologian and not a shabby one. He was a Greek scholar, you've already heard. He translated uh, the New Testament and was always working through it. An exegete, an author, and not just about counseling, many subjects. Jay was a pulpiteer, a magnificent preacher of the Word of God, a commentator on scripture, a scholar, a pastor, an entrepreneur, a movement leader, a counselor, a trainer of pastors. He was all those things, and in every one of them, in my estimation, he excelled. But on a personal level, there was another Jay Adams. Many of you have spoken of that Jay Adams as well. He was a dear friend and a husband a father, a passionate believer in and worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ, a discipler of men, an encourager. I like to think of Jay personally as a spiritual provocateur. One time he was at my house and he asked my children, he said, do you think I could poke your whole body through this hole? And he took his finger and began to poke them everywhere, all over their whole body. Of course, Jay is known for his development of the biblical counseling movement, which was a for, formerly known as Nuthetic Counseling. I first heard about it in a classroom at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in 1974. Uh, Dr. Gary Collins was critiquing Jay's book, um, The Christian Counselor's Manual and Competent to Counsel. And I wondered, I need to read that. That sounds fascinating. And then I, when I read it, I thought, What's wrong with this? Jay had the audacity to suggest that the word of Almighty God had something to say about the well-being of the psyche, the suke, the soul of man created by God. Of course, you know that the uh, New Thetic Counseling came from uh, the word Nuthateo in Romans uh, 15 verse 14 where we are told, in concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and able to admonish one another. Jay believed that by the Spirit of God, pastors are equipped with the Word of God to deal with the issues of the soul. But for Jay, Nuthetic Counseling was not so much a methodology as it was really a lifestyle. It was what he lived. It was who he sought to be. I kind of like to think on a personal level that David, was, uh, that, that Jay was a spiritual uh, provocateur, as I've already said, in accord with Hebrews 10, verse 24, a spiritual stimulant. Jay was a spiritual stimulant to my soul, to my spiritual growth, to me personally and also ministerially. So when my wife and I um, moved to Macon, Georgia in 1978, I had heard about Jay Adams. To my great surprise, he lived just a few miles north of Macon, and all the books that were written then had in them Jay Adams' The Mill House. They lived in a um, refurbished mill house just north of Macon, Georgia, and I was on the staff of First Presbyterian Church in Macon. 
And the Lord blessed us, my wife and I, with the privilege of meeting and developing a friendship that's lasted now for more than 40 years uh, with Jay and Betty Jane Adams. And the Lord had a profound impact on our lives as a result. How kind our Lord was, I often think, to bring this godly couple into our lives, a young couple just getting started in ministry. They opened their home with a warm embrace when all their kids were just high school students. And they taught us hospitality. They taught us to think biblically. And as for me in particular, Jay was a ready ear, just as many of you have said, ready to challenge me, to admonish me, to stimulate me, to love and good deeds with the truth of God's word. Before I moved to Statesboro, Georgia to plant a church, now almost 40 years ago, Jay probably spent, I don't know how many hours, a couple of days with me, talking to me about church planning. Ask any question you want. And he had all kinds of advice and ideas. Some of it I took, some of it was crazy. That's another story. How to select elders, what to preach. He even traveled to Statesboro, Georgia, a little nowhere place in Southeast Georgia to baptize my second child in a room over a cafeteria on the campus of Georgia Southern University. And he preached in that place just like he did from the pulpit of great churches. Jay was a spiritual stimulant for my sanctification. How I thank God for that man. Now, of course, as you well know, he could also be a wise guy. Once he gave me a book here, he's given books to many of you, I'm sure as well. He gave me a book and uh, when I received it, I said, thank you so much. I said, would you write something in it? He said, what would you like for me to write? I said, I don't know, write something neat. So he took the book and he wrote something in it and he gave it back to me and I looked at it and there were the two words, something neat. <laughs> <clears throat> Once I asked Jay what was a good book that I could read on eschatology. Now you're thinking he probably recommended a book called, an, um, yes, the time is at hand. Thank you. <laughs> he didn't. He said, uh, yes, the Bible, <laughs> which of course irritated me, but. As I think about it, that was a, a good suggestion. <laughs> Jay wanted me to wrestle with the text of Scripture. So I stand before you as we conclude this afternoon, and I give thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ for what he wrought in this man's life and how he used him in this world, in the church, and in my life in particular. Praise be to God. Amen. The Apostle Paul says, give honor to whom honor is due. Sometimes we fail to give honor to those whom honor is due. Sometimes we give honor to someone to whom honor is not due. Today, this afternoon, we give honor to one to whom honor is due. Knowing that all that we honor is that very work of the grace of God in a man's life that makes him to shine as an image bearer with the reflected glory of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of our dear brother, Jay Adams, now departed from this earth to be with you and to wait for that coming day of resurrection and the establishment of new heavens and new earth when we will all be reunited. Thank you for the manner in which our lives have been enriched by your work in and through him by your grace. Now, Heavenly Father, comfort us as we encounter times of loneliness and sorrow as we deal with his loss. And we make these our prayers in the blessed and everlasting name of our dear Savior, even Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, Roland Barnes. Roland is the pastor of the Trinity PCA Church in Statesboro, Georgia. I want to thank you all for coming and being a part of this occasion, and for the, all of you who participated, thank you. Now receive the Lord's benediction. Now may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you, both now and forevermore. Amen. They'll be re a receiving line outside some distance, okay? But family is going to exit now, and, and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>